Thomas Waters, the chef extraordinaire, and we're really pleased to have him today along with Lisa. So let's give a warm welcome uh, for the presentation, which is called Marriages and Contrasts, it's including wine tasting of, of some of the Alsatian varieties. for having me and I'm going to be reading my speech as I go. I'm not as well polished as the, uh, the folks before me and certainly the folks after me, so uh, bear with me. I'm a better chef, hopefully. So, Anyways, good morning. I'm here to speak about food and wine or more specifically how food impacts wine and vice versa. Um, so to me, matching food and wine is about a series of marriages and contrasts. Uh, so we're going to explore taste to see how food and wine work together from a chef's perspective. Um, I'm going to begin with a brief history of myself, followed by some general food and wine pairing tips, um, then figuring out what taste is from a chef's perspective, and then finally we're going to taste some wines together if I don't bore you guys too much in the process. So food shaped my story from the very beginning. Um, while I was in the womb, my grandfather insisted on feeding my, my pregnant mother foie gras and truffles, you know, to ensure that despite growing up in America away from the French motherland, I would become a proper gourmet. And uh, unfortunately, it happened well. But uh, um, so the feasting continued on day one. That's my mom in the, in the middle and my father on the right. And uh, instead of getting the traditional spank and sip of mother's milk to hear on my arrival, I was handed a flute of bubbles and a serious addiction to the good life. Uh, so you see, my mother was born in Champagne, and it's an age-old tradition to uh, instead, well, before you spank the baby, it's tr uh, tradition to give a sip of champagne first. So that was quite a shock in Chicago in the 60s. Um, anyways, uh, so the way my mother recounts my birth, I was being hung upside down, kind of like a rabbit about to be spanked. And my mom growled at the doctor, you know, yelled at him with a like, devil-like uh, devil -like ferocity uh, that I needed a glass of champagne to start it off right. And it's best not to question a woman who just had a, the equivalent of a melon pass through like an intimate part of her anatomy. So the doctor complied. Um, my mother came from an upper middle class family in the south of France. Um, the extent of her food education prior to me and my father was spent more eating in restaurants and uh, having her family cook, prepare meals for the house. Um, ironically, my mom learned how to cook from Julia Child, reading her books and watching her TV shows. And so I spent a lot of my youth pretending to be a little bit more French version of Julia Child. <laughs> if that's possible, and with my accent, it's really hard to uh, <laughs> believe that anyways. Um, so it may be cliche to claim that someone learned to cook hanging off their mother's apron strings, but I really did. That's my mom right there. Um, she was a free-spirited natural. She, she cooked like a jazz music, musician riffs. She never really followed recipes too closely. It was kind of like edible poetry in constant motion. And she really passed on this uh, kind of fearless style of cooking that was never daunted by lengthy recipes or even following them religiously. With my mother was, Francois, could you be this in there or be this that? That's how I learned how to cook. So to me, you know, food and wine pairings is, is kind of the same thing. You know, I don't want you to feel obligated and stuck in a prison, you know, by certain rules. Really, the most important thing is to be happy. Um, so, excuse me, sorry. Um, so one of the great stories of uh, my childhood was of a Moroccan party my mom threw. She had sawed off all the legs of the table, our dining room table, and took all our household uh, cushions and just ringed the table. And uh, I'll never forget that look my dad had when uh, he came home that night. My dad kind of was like on the other side of the frontier. He was very aristocratic, so it's kind of good for him. Um, the pets in our household never fared too well either. By uh, age two, I had fill filleted my sister's goldfish, and by age seven, I ate my pet rabbits. And that kind of happens in French houses. Eventually, I stopped cooking my pets, and I went to the New England Culinary Institute. Um, 
over the years, I followed my natural path to becoming a chef, worked in a bunch of restaurants across the country, Canada, uh, even in a, I did a stash for Jean Robichon in Paris in 96. Um, over the next 25 years, like I said, I worked in a lot of restaurants. Um, I ended up working for Bob and Claudia at uh, Claudia Springs Winery here. And uh, anyways, in 2014, I left the ranges for good. I moved up to Portland with my wife and decided I want to spend a little bit more time with my son, uh, who's five now. Uh, he's kind of proclaimed himself to be our family saucier and definitely following in the footsteps. But um, anyways, and I've just published my first cookbook. It's on the south of France. It's called Cuisine of the Sun, a ray of sunshine onto the plate. So that will also be available today if anybody wants to buy a copy. Um, okay, so food needs wine and wine needs food. The most basic pairing rule of them all, actually the golden rule is drink whatever you like. Uh, Life is about pleasure and shouldn't be taken too seriously. And really, matching food and wine can be a scary process for some people. So I, I think you should just make it fun and have a good time doing it. And really, the reality of eating out in restaurants is rarely does everybody sitting at the table order the same dish. So it follows suit that no single wine is actually going to work for everybody at the table. Um, rule number two, which is equally as boring as rule number one, is red with meat and white with fish. Um, that's a really tired old rule. There's obviously lots of exceptions, but it's a starting point. But I realize you guys didn't come here today to hear those two basic rules, so I want to kind of go a little bit deeper than that. Um, one of the great ways to pair wine in a lot of parts of the world is regional pairings. So this works well in France, Spain, Italy. I don't think it works as well in America because we haven't really developed our national palate the same way they have in Europe. Um, I mean, there's certainly great wines, and there's also great chefs and great food being prepared here, but you don't see the same regionality that you have in Europe. Um, you know, for instance, if you walk into a restaurant in Poyac and you order a roast lamb, that's a, just a great natural pairing. Um, also, birds and burgundies is a great pairing. Especially, to me, Pinot Noirs that have lower fruit, lower alcohol, and a little bit brighter acidity. Lower alcohols to me, lower alcohol levels to me seem to be one of the most essential factors in pairing wine and food together. The acidity cuts through the fattiness, kind of like when you're making a vinaigrette and you're balancing between oil and, uh, oil and vinegar. Um, I like to make my chicken the way they do in Dijon. I roast it, simple uh, mustard sauce. And um, I always like serving with that a roast, uh, sorry, a, a white burgundy or a chardonnay. The other night, my wife and I were drinking a um, 2003 Paul Hobbs Richard Dinner Vineyard Chardonnay that was just like unbelievable with the chicken. Um, yeah, pretty much I thought I died and went to heaven. Um, the same rules apply in Alsace. You know, if you eat a rich, salty, chaud cru that's kind of subtly spiced with juniper, then take a taste of a, a Gewurztraminer, or you have a match made in heaven. Um, so there's a, about a million infographics online to help guide us. Some are humorous, like this one right here, um, and some are kind of complicated and really don't make a lot of sense when you look at them. Um, so to me, some of the best, the best pairings can be explained in terms of marriages and contrasts. Flavors that pull together are marriages. So think of like a buttery lobster dish with a Chardonnay, or perhaps a uh, grilled ribeye steak with a big Cabernet. Um, contrasts are pairings that are seemingly opposite. So it's much like pairing acidic wines with fatty dishes, or slightly sweet wines with spicy dishes like a off-dry Gewurztraminer are paired with a spicy Moroccan tagine. Um, this is the basic process of how we perceive what we eat and drink. We take a bite, we taste it, then we swallow and reflect on the experience. Brilliant Severin, who is a famous French gastronom, wrote in his book, Physiology of Taste. Um, he described taste as a three-stage process. So one, it's direct on the tongue. 
Two, it's complete when food and wine passes over the tongue and is swallowed. And three, you have a period of reflection where you pass judgment by the soul on the impressions that have been transmitted to it by the tongue. Um, so what are the basic elements of taste? They're sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami. I probably add fatty as a sixth element, um, especially in this day and age. So uh, these are all basic terms. I don't think they really need to be explained other than umami is savory or meaty, those kind of flavors. Uh, matching components on a plate requires a bit of thought. Some of the best wine dinners I've ever done have been the direct result of close collaboration <coughs> with sommeliers. Usually the process worked. I would, I would prepare a dish, the sommelier would open up the wine that they wanted to pair, and then we kind of go back and forth adjusting the flavors. I might add little bits of like baking spices like cinnamon or cloves to a dish. Uh, uh, not a perceptible amount, but just enough to kind of make it pair up with the wine a little bit better. And so creating a dish is about weaving seemingly imperceptible layers of flavors and textures together. You know, sometimes you add a few drops of lemon juice or verju or vinegar, not enough to where you taste it, but it, it cuts like a fatty sauce, like a cream sauce, and just makes it a little bit less one-dimensional on your tongue and a little bit more interesting. So the um, acid simply highlights the other flavors and kind of pushes them forward in your mouth. And it's really not much different than pairing a slightly acidic wine with a rich dish. So to understand how, how a brilliant chef breaks this down, as opposed to myself, I turned to Gray Coons. When I knew him, uh, he used to be a customer of mine when I worked up in New York at a Roland Chateau property. He had a second home up there. And he was actually working on a book called The Elements of Taste. So I'm going to kind of paraphrase this book a bit because it's really hard to say, to explain taste from a chef perspective better than what Gray did in this book. So there's three basic categories and each category is filled with 14 elements. So the first one is taste that push, that's salty, that's sweet, it's pecan, and pecan I mean spicy, not as in like, uh, not spicy as in like cinnamon. So Gray describes this like a wave approaching the shore, or a wind blowing across the plains. They push everything forward. So you remove any one of these elements and the dish becomes flat and boring. And these are the basic characteristics that chefs play with when they're creating dishes. All three of those can heighten all the other tastes in a dish. Salt is the number one by a long shot. And our reaction to it might come from the fact that life evolved from the sea originally. Um, so I, I think we have a natural predilection towards uh, salinity. Um, so sweet's important because it can hit you up front on your palate and it kind of rounds off the sharp edges of pungent spices like cloves or tangy flavors like citrus and that mellows the salinity. Pecan flavors hit you differently. They react with your pain sensors rather than your taste buds. So pain and pleasure are linked. This is more of the contrast which I was talking about earlier. And the correct amount of heat can push flavors forward. So think of like a great Zinfandel with a charred peppercorn crusted steak. You know, they just work really well together. Um, taste that pull are tangy, vented, bulby, floral and herby, and aromatic and funky. These are tastes that bring every flavor forward with them. Tangy and sour tastes like vinegar and lemon juice make you pucker. Instead of rounding off the flavors, they make things brighter. So think of lemon and shellfish. You pop open an oyster, you squeeze a bit of lemon, and it kind of brightens the briny flavors. Uh, Brilliant Severin, I'm gonna refer back to him again for a second. He said, smell and taste form a single sense, of which the mouth is the laboratory and the nose is the chimney. Or more exactly, of which one serves for the tasting of the actual body the other for savoring of their gases. So what he's basically saying is without the nose, there's no, there's no taste. We need a sense of smell in order to appreciate what's in our glass or on our plate. Most tastes are anchored in the nose and smell. Some are anchored in the mouth and palate. So wine has two pulling characteristics. 
The bitterness cuts through rich dishes and cleans the palate. Fruit brings with it sweet that complements the salt. Excuse <coughs> me. Bulby tastes are those that come from the um, various members of the onion family. So when they're cooked, they transform from sharp taste to nutty, nutty sugary taste. They hit your palate first, and they pull all the other flavors forward. Floral and herby flavors help focus specific tastes. Think of things, like, think of herbs like basil and tarragon that kind of have a licorice flavor. They help pull sweetness out of a dish. Rosemary and thyme accentuate salty components and also helps bring out umami and meat and seafood. Aromatic flavors are things like saffron, cloves, cinnamon, gray rites. When experienced as pure taste on the tongue, these ingredients are often bitter, but their function is not, as, not so much mouth taste as it is the aromas it pulls, uh, the, as the aromas that pulls taste. So think of the way when you put cinnamon in a cookie, it kind of elevates the sweetness without making it overly sweet. Or the way when you add curry to like a seafood dish, it brings out ocean flavors, or cloves brings out, you know, beautiful flavors in a roast pork. Um, funky taste is kind of a broad category, and it's really, there's not one single common thread that kind of locks anything in that category. So think of cheeses like a quoise, Fasheren, or even a real monster from Alsace. Think about black truffles or even aged hams. Um, I used to serve a six-year-old Spanish ham that had a, just a beautiful, incredible, funky taste to it. So funky flavors are kind of like great age wines. They complement food better than simple grape juice does. Think of beef and truffles. Funky foods or funky flavors ground food. They kind of bring us back to our origins. Going back to Gray for a second, it's the, prim sorry, it's the same primal tension between base matter and lofty spirituality that makes us human. Tastes that punctuate are sharp and bitter taste. So in Gray's taste experience, it's defined by a three-part process. It's aroma, mouth taste, and then finally texture. Texture as X is a culinary punctuation. Crunch is a stop signal. One taste ends and another begins. Fat acts as commas, kind of disseminating taste by spreading them across your palate and carrying the aromas to your nose. Texture and fat are not flavor components, they're only punctuations. Bitter foods also act like punctuations. They can bring taste to like a complete stop. Um, so really to fully understand a dish, we need to stop the sensation in our mouth and give us a, a minute to reflect about it and to process what you're eating. Bitter flavors are like watercress, cranberry, red wine, even beer. And so picture in your mind a beautiful prime rib served with freshly grated horseradish. Obviously horseradish is both sharp and bitter, but it stops taste dead on your tongue. The punctuation, the punctuation provides a great contrast to the meal. A, a glass of red wine does the same thing. So each of these elements plays on four basic taste stages or platforms that chefs build upon. You have garden, meaty, oceanic, and starchy. All platform ingredients have to have textural elements to them. If something's crunchy, you notice that first, it kind of punctuates between one set of taste or another. If something's creamy or, um, creamy or smooth, it rounds out flavors and mellows taste. So the four, four platforms are basically uh, very straightforward. Garden tastes are things like vegetables, fruits. Raw, they can be crunchy, refreshing. Um, when, you, when you cook them, the sugars come out and they sweeten and smooth, just like these roast carrots here. Um, meat is a foundation upon which greatness is built. So it never quite loses its meatiness but it supports a multitude of other flavors. Oceanic flavors are similar in a sense to meats, but they have a bit more bouquet and they're a bit more refined. And depending on the richness and oil content, they can range from subtle flavors to very strong flavors. So think of soul compared to mackerel. Starchy foods have twin personalities. They can be soft and mushy, as in potatoes or gnocchi like those right there. 
They could be crispy or crunchy if you think of like french fries. So the, the primary function is texture. Smooth st starches like mashed potatoes, they round out sharper flavors. They clean the palate, they get you ready for the next taste. And this is really important when you're, or this is an important component when you're tasting a complex dish. You need punctuations to really appreciate what you're eating. And the same goes with wine. Greg brings us back to the wine world by saying, as you sip, swirl, and spritz through 20 or 30 wines, you could be served a Romani Conti that fetches a thousand bucks a bottle, and your tongue would respond with the energy of an overfed uncle sneezing in front of a television. <laughs> okay, so now that I've bored you for a little while, I wanna, I wanna start drinking some of the wine and tasting the food that's in front of you. Um, if you could do me a favor and just kind of wait to taste the food and also save enough wine for um, three tastes, um, it'll make it a little bit better. Um, and you know, there's going to be plenty of wine later on anyways with the grand tasting, so let's pace ourselves a bit here. Um, so I'm approaching the four wines we're tasting today strictly from an educational point of view. <coughs> Typically when you're build, building menus and wine pairings, you usually start out with lighter things and work up to larger, more substantial flavors. Um, today we're kind of just kind of going our own direction. Um, so there's a few basic pairing rules I want to go over. These are general rules, they're meant to be broken, but we got to start somewhere. So we all know about classic combinations, birds and burgundies, poyox and roast lamb, barolas and truffles. These are all time-honored uh, combinations, they're fantastic. Acidic wines pair great with acidic foods. Think of uh, champagne with smoked salmon and a squeeze of lemon. <laughs> Pretty much champagne's good with anything, but the, the lemon, or the acidity in the lemon bridges with the acids in the champagne and forms a marriage with the wine. Uh, another rule is matching intensities of food and wine. One wine writer I read wrote, mismatching intensity, the result is like a fight between a featherweight and a heavyweight boxer. The biggest, strongest contender holds an unfair advantage. So heavy wines go great with heavier foods obviously lighter wines with lighter foods. And also pay attention to every component in the dish. Don't forget about the sauce. You know, so uh, Chardonnay goes great with a simple roast chicken, but a spiced curry chicken might not go well with that Chardonnay. Um, so the first wine we're gonna try is a beautiful Riesling from Emile Bear. And um, taste the wine by itself without any of the food. For me, I get a lot of apricots, tangerine, kiwi, passion fruit, a little bit of green, uh, green tea, slate, <coughs> even a touch of geranium. You know, for me, I, I just, I really love this wine. I think it's a beautiful Riesling. Now, um, the first dish you're gonna try, it's in the little Dixie cup. So that's a sashimi of steelhead. So this uh, steelhead was caught Wednesday on the Canal River by the Canal Indian tribe and um, I got it from them. So when you're tasting this, hold back a little piece of ginger if you can, because I want you to try something with that a little bit later. But taste, taste the food, you know, just chew on all the, the steelhead. Really get it good in your mouth. There's a little bit of raw garlic in there. There is um, ginger, soy, a little touch of olive oil and sesame oil. Now try the wine again, and for me, the. When I taste the wine, it makes the wine a little bit rounder in your mouth. It softens the wine. The astringency in the raw garlic and the ginger kind of disappears and fades away. If you still have a piece of ginger, take the piece of ginger now and just really chew on it and get that good, like, bright ginger flavor in your mouth. And then taste the wine again. And so the ginger kind of acts like the horseradish in my example. It, it's a punctuation. And I find when I drink the wine after the ginger, you know, once again it makes, the wine rounds off the edges on the raw ginger. I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful combination for my, for my taste. So in this dish, we had an oceanic platform we had lots of great flavors that marry well with the Riesling. We had a couple of flavors that punctuate 
And so for me, it's a beautiful example that two great things can make an even better one. Now I want to talk about contrast. So rich, fatty foods pair well with acidic wines. Sweet foods pair well with acidic wines. Sweet foods pair well with tannic and bitter wines. Bitter and fat work well together. Alcohol and fat work well together. Alcohol and sweet works well together. Sweet and salty pairings work well together. But acidic and salty don't pair well alone. You need a third partner, and then it becomes a, a menage a trois. All right, so now let's move on to the pork and foie gras riette. Um, that's next in your list. So this time, try the food first. And I want you to notice the strong kind of clove flavors in there. There's also a lot of salt, rich fattiness from the pork fat and from the foie gras. In a way, it's almost a little bit unbalanced, you know, if it wasn't so good. And I hope you're enjoying it as well. I'm not just up here looking like an idiot. Um, now smell the cremant. So in the nose, I get lots of citrus. I get grapefruit, a little bit of pineapple, red berries. And it's almost, to me, it's almost like that red berry you get, like, um, almost like the fake red berry you get that's a little bit like uh, in soft drinks and like candies we all ate when we were growing up. And I don't know if anybody was here a couple of years ago, there was a sommelier from the Bellagio, and he kept talking about Flintstone chewable vitamins. <laughs> and it, you know, it was really kind of a crazy uh, comparison, but it really worked for me. I don't know why, maybe I grew up in that age. Um, but anyways, take, take another bite of the Riette. And when you got, you know, the fat really coating in your mouth, take another sip. And uh, for me, notice how the acidity just kind of cuts through the fat. It runs off some of the sharper edges of the clove and kind of mellows some of the acidity, acidity that you're getting. I'm sorry, mellows the salinity. Okay. And so to me, you know, when you take another sip of wine, it kind of makes the wine a little bit more three-dimensional. The wine changed. Um, to me, it made the wine actually a little bit sharper than it was when you tasted it on its own. All right. So many love affairs start out passionately and then they end up in divorce court. I didn't really want to talk about this to you guys had a couple sips of wine. It's a little bit depressing, so I kind of want to hurry through this one. So bitter and bitter don't work well together. High alcohol and spicy doesn't work well together. So the next wine we're going to try is the 2008 Grand Cru Gewürztraminer. <coughs> and take a sip of the wine. For me, and no disrespect to Louis Sepp, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of this wine. Um, I love Gewürztraminers. I'm just... I'm not crazy about this one by itself. I think for me it's a little bit flabby, it's a little bit too sweet. It doesn't have all the flavors that we look for in a Gewürztraminer on its own. To me this is a, this is a wine that really truly needs some food with it. And if uh, Louis Sip is here, I really apologize. <laughs> but originally I wanted to serve this with a Munster cheese, and I live up in Portland right now. All the, all the cheese shops were like completely full of Munster cheese. Then of course I go to do this event, boom, they're all gone. So I got a poisse, so you know, obviously it comes from Burgundy, but I think you get some of the same funkiness that you do in a real Munster. So, I want you to take a bite of the epoise and eat it with the rind. If you normally shy away from it, I think you really need to eat it. We kind of want to get all the funky flavors we can get in our mouth right now. And so while you still got the funky flavors in your mouth, take another sip of the Gewürztraminer. And I think, I think the cheese, for me, it brings out a little bit more depth. It also brings out like some real apricot flavors to the wine. Um, you know, so once again, this is just a wine, in my opinion, that really needs some food with it. Now I'll, I want to try something a little bit different, because actually I was on the Louis Sip site, 
and they suggested pairing it with tomatoes and anchovies. <laughs> and that just it seemed so absurd to me, and I had to try it. I happened to have all the above in my house when I was tasting the wine. Um, so right now, I want to really actually, and, and once again, sorry to Louis Sip, but I want you to see what a divorce really looks like. So <laughs> eat the tomato and eat the anchovy at the same time and just really get that anchovy flavor like worked up in your mouth and on your teeth. And before you completely swallow, take your last sip of wine. And so, I don't know, for me, at least when I was tasting it in my house in, uh, up in Portland, it just made the wine like really one dimensional and almost like made it too sweet. You know, so, you know, earlier we kind of talked about regional pairings, and to me, this is why Alsace is thousands of miles from Provence. You know? <laughs> these, these two don't belong together. And you know, once again, I don't mean uh, Louis Sip as a producer any disrespect. I love it. I love their wines, but I want real Alsatian food to pair up with that. Um, so, lastly, we're going to return to the land of blissful marriages and end on a high note, kind of riding hand in hand into the sunset on a unicorn. Ah, uh, but so we're going to try a late harvest Gewurztraminer from Hush. And uh, I want you to smell this wine first. Don't actually taste it. For me, uh, this wine is just so beautiful. It's so aromatic. It's delicious. It's got honey, apricot, orange marmalade. It's got clove flavors going on. It's almost a crime, really, to eat anything with this wine. This is a wine that can truly stand on its own. I think it's that good. In, in fact, every time I drink this wine, angels start to sing. That's my wife's sense of humor right there. That's the clean ones. You should see the other ones. She does. <laughs> Anyways, so this is a really complex wine, and I would have no trouble pairing this up with uh, a foie gras torchon, or like a salty blue cheese. Or even, um, actually when I was reading the tech sheet for this wine, they were talking about um, uh, apple crumble, um, or an apple crisp, or like even a creme brulee. And so that got me thinking, you know, why not marry the two? And so I, at, at home I made an apple creme brulee tart. Um, unfortunately, when I'm making little tasting bites for so many people, it's kind of hard to get the same dish. So I went for the flavor, so, you know, hopefully you're a little buzzed now and you realize the creme brulee is not really a creme brulee. But, um, you know, so, but it's got all the flavors we need. So I want you to take a big sip in your mouth and, and don't swallow it. And just close your eyes and think about your first childhood love. You know, I mean, this wine's that good. You know, it starts out sweet, finishes dry. And I'm curious, did anybody hear the angels sing when they tasted that wine? It's good, right? It's amazing. All right, now take a bite of the apple creme brulee tart. And to bring out the flavors better in, in the uh, tart, I added a little bit of cloves and cinnamon, a little bit of honey and the orange zest. You know, so, you know, there's a part of kind of marrying the flavors together. And uh, take another sip of the wine. You know, now I get more, um, more of an explosion of like apricots in my mouth. I get, if you think about it, I get little bits of passion fruit in there, maybe a little bit of kumquat, a little bit of melon. And so I, I just think it's a great combination. And uh, so anyways, at the grand tasting, I'm gonna be serving more Riette. If anybody wants to buy my cookbook, I have some copies that are gonna be available. I'll be happy to sign them for you. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll try not to sound too stupid in answering them. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for joining us.